I'd like to thank you all for joining this talk. So my name is Dan Pechev. I'm an open source software engineer, or in the spirit of this talk, I'm an open source wizard. And we are part of the G Research open source team, where our responsibility is to spread the good word of open source and contribute back to the amazing communities which build such awesome projects. So today, we'll look and demystify a lot of magic around the Cube Scheduler, around WebAssembly. We'll try to build some Cube Scheduler plugins using different frameworks, different toolings, uh, see how we can test that at scale. And yeah, handing over to my colleague, who is actually a grand wizard of open source. So Jonathan, to you. <laughs> Thank you, Dayan. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, KubeCon. Uh, I'm Jonathan Gianuzzi. I also work for G Research, based in London. And in my role on the open source team, I've done all kinds of witchcraft, from speeding up .NET runtime startup on Apple Silicon Macs, from uh, solving caching issues in Docker Build Kit, or more recently, building a machine learning experiment tracker to support complex research workflows. But uh, today, I'm not here to discuss any of that. Instead, Diane and I are excited to share some Kubernetes wizardry. So let's get ready for a WASM and Kubernetes journey filled with enchantment. And it all starts with the mysterious Kubernetes scheduler. The Kubernetes scheduler is an essential control plane component of the Kubernetes cluster. It's responsible for determining which pods sorry, which nodes in the cluster should run the newly created pods, and it's taking, the, for, it's taking into account each pod's resource requirements, like the CPU, the memory, and also the current state of the nodes. It will go and carefully evaluate constraints and resource availability to select the most suitable node for a pod. It's almost like casting a careful placement spell. Additionally, the scheduler manages preemption by ident identifying and removing lower priority pods from nodes where there aren't enough resources available for the higher priority pods to run. Now let's dive into the enchanting scheduling lifecycle and see how it all unfolds. So the scheduling lifecycle will involve several phases to manage the pod placement efficiently and fairly. We'll work through these phases in order from left to right. There's a first group which is queuing, then scheduling, then binding. In the queuing group, we start with pre and queue. This is before pods that enter the scheduling queue. The scheduler can already filter them. This will ensure that only the eligible and properly configured pods proceed to the next step. Next step is sort. Once the pods are in the queue, the scheduler will sort them based on criteria, like priority. That will ensure that the most critical or higher priority pods are scheduled before others. We then move on to the actual scheduling cycle, the green box, where it starts with filter. I'm skipping the pre-stuff. Uh, the scheduler begins by filtering out the nodes that don't meet the pod's requirements, such as resource needs or specific node labels. Um, then there's post filter, which is in red there, which uh, means that if after filtering there are no nodes that are available, this is where preemption will kick in. Next one is score, where each feasible node is scored uh, based on factors like available resources and affinity rules and this will help identify which node is the best fit for the pod. Then we've got reserve, which is uh, essentially to tentatively reserved, uh, reserve um, uh, a node for the pod before we are done with the scheduling cycle. Uh, permit will uh, approve or deny the placement. Um, and finally, if no nodes are available to the pods at the end of the scheduling cycle, then the pod goes back into the queue. And the last one, which is really not the least, is the bind. This is when the scheduler will cast the final spell, which will bind the pod to the selected nodes by making the appropriate API call to the cluster API, which will assign the pod to the node, and then it can start running. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so. What we want to introduce is the Kubernetes scheduler simulator. So imagine if you have a safe, isolated space where you can test, where you can tweak, and where you can optimize your scheduling strategy without affecting your live clusters. So literally, that's what the scheduler simulator offers, a playground to experiment with different scheduling algorithms 
uh, you can simulate real world loads and discover possible performance improvements in a controlled environment. So unfortunately, not all plugins yield good results. So plugin developers who customize the scheduler need to make sure that what they did, well, actually provides an improvement. So because it's really easy to introduce negative impact and just make everything slower. In real Kubernetes clusters, uh, it's pretty difficult to get all of the results of a uh, scheduling cycle in detail because uh, usually in order to do that, you need access to the scheduler to get the scheduler logs. Uh, that usually requires privileged access to the control plane. And um, these were all the challenges which inspired the simulator project to be created. So when you build some plugins, you can immediately try them out, uh, test them, visualize, get observability, get some metrics. And uh, I think that's enough talk. We could, we could actually see something in action. So um, in the link tree, in the QR code, there is a um, uh, URL to a repo where we prepared all of the examples. If you want to scan it again, we'll show it at the end. So first is the simulator. Let's start it. Nice. So here, from here, we can, uh, we can set up nodes. We can uh, add various Kubernetes resources. We can also tweak, uh, fine tune the Kubernetes scheduler configuration, which uh, in turn dictates how the scheduler will behave in our environment. So let's demystify the scheduling a bit. Let's see what happens and why a pod goes to some node and what influences this. So if we look at the uh, scheduler setting, we see here a lot of scheduler plugins which are enabled by default. And all of these plugins do. Some are filtering plugins, scoring plugins. Uh, before going in depth into all of them, let's actually start with an example. So I'll create two nodes. Two nodes, each of the nodes will contain 32 gigabytes of memory. So let that be wizards one node. Let's create a wizards, oh, actually, sorry, name. Let's create a wizards two. So we have two nodes, each containing 32 gigabytes of memory. Uh, let's schedule some pod. So uh, how do we name it? We're in the whole wizardry spirit. Let it be Gandalf. So Gandalf requires 16 gigabytes of uh, memory if we apply it. Gandalf gets bound to the Wizards 1 node. If we open it, we can see uh, the filter plugins, all of them passed for both nodes. If we take a look at the scoring plugins, we see also the node resources balanced allocation and node resources fit uh, scoring plugins returned identical score. So at this point, it's just a random on which node it goes. Uh, in this case, it went to the Wizards 1. If we Create another one, so let's, who is a famous wizard? Let's try with Saruman. So Saruman went to the second node. If you look, filter plugins all return the same, but now the scoring plugins return different results. So for the first node, the resources balanced allocation returns a lower score, node resources fit return the lower score, so overall wizards two node is the winner, and the pod is scheduled there. Oh, now let's an epic crossover and let's add some Harry Potter universe. So let's here do some Dumbledore. It goes to the Wizards 1. If you look at score, again, identical scores. It went to the first. If we try to add another one now, name, it wouldn't be complete without Harry Potter. Harry went to the second one, which is expected because we intuitively know uh, that uh, the wizard's node, the wizard's one node is full, but if you look at it, if you look at the filter plugins, so node resources fit, uh, declared wizard's one as unschedulable, Re reason is insufficient memory, and the scoring cycle wasn't even needed to run here because we have only one node where this can run. So yeah, that's how the Harry pod went to wizard's two node. Jonathan, do you want to spread some magic? Yeah, always. Okay. 
<laughs> yes. Here you go. All right. So if you came to this talk, you're quite likely to wonder how you can conjure up your own scheduling spells. So we will start with the OG, the schedule extenders. So the schedule extenders were the original methods for extending the Kubernetes scheduler uh, to simple JSON-based webhooks. And this allows any programming language to be used. And while this approach allows flexibility, it can also introduce higher latency in the scheduling decisions. This is mostly because of network calls and also serialization, deserialization of JSON. Um, it will also lack cache consistency uh, with the scheduler's internal state because it is running as a completely separate process. So it needs to maintain its, uh, if it's a stateful plugin, it will need to maintain its own state as well. Uh, the extenders can influence various phases of the scheduling process, such as filter, preempt, which is the post filter, uh, prioritize, which is basically sort, um, and bind. And notably during the bind phase, an extender can completely take over the actual binding of the pods to the nodes, effectively replacing the scheduler's binding logic and providing full control over how the pods are assigned. This whole mechanism enables customized scheduling decision, but comes with trade-offs in terms of performance and consistency. So now, let's head to the Slytherin dungeon, as I'm going to show you how to write an extender in Python. So, uh, first I will explain what we're trying to achieve with this, uh, this extender. So, we chose, for example, the idea of having a regex extension. So what we mean by that is that it's, it's a very simple filter plugin. It's quite silly. You could do the same kind of stuff with labels and, and, and other things. But in all case, we're going to look for a very specific annotation and, uh, in the pods. And if that annotation contains a regex, then we're going to compile that regex and we're going to apply it to match with the nodes. The nodes that are matching will be returned as, uh, uh, as uh, matching nodes. And the other ones will be marked as unschedulable. So let's dive into the code. This is written using modern async Python with fast API. Uh, we have essentially just one um, endpoint, which is slash filter. In that endpoint, the first thing we do is we just retrieve, uh, we decode uh, the, the data that we receive through JSON. This will contain the entire information about all the nodes in the cluster, which is really heavy. Um, and it will contain information about the pod being scheduled. The first thing we do is that we look for uh, the annotation. If we don't find any annotation, then we just return success, because then we're not concerned with that pod. We then try to compile the regex. If, the, if it is an invalid regex, then we actually uh, return an error, which will mark the pod as unschedulable um, for, for, for all the nodes. It basically, that pod will need to be deleted uh, otherwise, it will just be retried over and over. And then we just build, we've got a list of nodes, list of failed nodes. We just go through them with our regex. Uh, interestingly, the nodes, what we return is, again, the entire node list, uh, which, again, can get pretty heavy. Uh, there is an optimization that could be done, which is that if your plugin is node cache capable and can actually query and maintain the cache about the nodes, then you can use, an, um, you can get only node names instead, which we could have done for this plugin, uh, because it, it's quite a silly plugin after all. Um, let me now deploy it. So this is just a make target that is building a Docker image with the Python code, with UV, etc., and then running it. Um, you can see the logs over here. Now, we have created a few nodes uh, before. Phoenix 1, Oz. We're going to configure our extender. To do that, I will need to add this to the scheduler config. This is basically uh, saying, this is the URL where you can find my extender, and this is the path to the filter endpoint, so slash filter. I'm applying this. And now we'll create a new pod. So we should have some women as well. Let's go with Glinda from the Oz universe. And Glinda did get scheduled onto the Oz pod. 
as we expected. Unfortunately, we won't see the results over here. That's the limitation, current limitation of the simulator. But the simulator is also adding all kinds of annotations. If you look closely on this annotation, the extended filter result, you will see that we return all the matching nodes. This is, again, as I said, a lot of data. And the fail nodes with the reason for their failure. And that's it for Thank this you, Jonathan. Demo. Quite a lovely demo. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so uh, after scheduler extenders um, became the scheduling framework, which is a framework, uh, framework built into the core Kubernetes. Uh, it's a pluggable architecture for the scheduler. So it uh, consists of a set of plugin APIs that uh, are compiled directly into the scheduler. And these APIs allow most scheduling features to be implemented as plugins. So the idea was to keep the core logic uh, lightweight, maintainable, and then you can just uh, easily import that framework, define your plugins, and uh, easily, actually not that easily, but <laughs> build your custom schedulers. So um, a couple of terms here. There are the concept of in-tree and out-of-tree plugins. In-tree plugins are plugins which live in the Kubernetes code base. When I showed the simulator, when I uh, opened the scheduler config, there was a default scheduler profile, and it had a couple of uh, plugins enabled by default. And uh, some of those plugins are node name plugin. For specific node placement, this is a filter plugin which, uh, if a pod defines a node name, it matches it with the nodes, and for which node it matches, it filters out the rest. There is an image locality plugin which uh, prioritizes cached images, meaning uh, that's a scoring plugin which will assign higher scores to the nodes which have the Docker image cached which the pod wants to execute. Uh, there is the node resources fit plugin, which uh, also does filtering and scoring and ensure a node has uh, the required resources available that the pod requests. Um, besides that, there are out of three plugins. Out of three plugins are plugins which live outside of the Kubernetes code base. So those are plugins built using the scheduling framework. Uh, most popular repo is the Kubernetes SIG scheduler plugins, which contains, there is the capacity scheduling plugin. Uh, you have co-scheduling for uh, all or nothing scheduling. You have plugins for um, network aware scheduling, uh, power efficiency aware scheduling. So you could use that to customize your strategy based on how, literally how you want it to work. So, um, Let's see how we can build the same plugin which Jonathan described now uh, using Go and the scheduling framework. So, okay, if we go, uh, like, one more time. Hmm? Again. Ah, amazing, thank you. So, yeah, like I said, we import the scheduling framework. And then we want to build just a filter plugin, meaning we need to implement only the filter method. We do literally the same thing. We get the annotation. If it exists, uh, we compile the pattern. If it's fine, then we do match. If it is a match, we return a success. Otherwise, we return unschedulable. And yeah, pretty simple plugin. Here's the going implementation. And uh, the key difference, with the key difference that this one actually will get called for each node. Yes, thank you for reminding me. So, uh, yeah, uh, based on Jonathan's extender, uh, there the Kubernetes scheduler will send a list of all nodes, but here, because this is baked into the scheduler, the filter uh, method is called, so in a scheduling cycle for a pod, this method is called for each node which is evaluated, and also you have parallelism uh, configuration in the scheduler config, so this can be done in parallel to speed it up. And uh, let's say we want to use it in a real-world Kubernetes cluster. So what we would do in this case is uh, in, we would create a main function. In that main function, we would import the complete cube scheduler application. So 
we import it, we run the cube scheduler. Only difference is when we are instantiating the command, we have the ability to provide options. And the option which is of interest to us is this with plugin, where we wrap the original Kubernetes scheduler and we register our custom plugins. After that, we would build this, package it in a Docker image, and then we have two options. If we have privileged access to the control plane, we can just update the scheduler to use our new custom image, or if we don't have, we can just start wrap this in a Kubernetes deployment, start this alongside the default scheduler, and just define a different scheduling profile in the scheduler configuration. Uh, before we do all of those steps, Probably we would want to validate that our plugin works. Our plugin is uh, performant. So actually we can go to the scheduler and uh, to the simulator and test the plugin out. So the simulator already has support for defining plugins and testing them. So if we go to the simulator, then simulator, in this case we would import our plugin we just wrote. Okay, this got added. Uh, then we just reference it here. So in uh, simulator, scheduler, uh, simulator scheduler config plugin go, there is support where you can uh, import your out of three plugins. So we add, this is our module. Here we say regex name of our plugin, regex new. Okay, let's try to build it. Let's see if simulator is happy. Those, those make targets are very convenient. They do a lot of heavy lifting behind the scenes. So whoever is interested, please check out the repo. We yeah. really did our best to make it as simple as possible. Uh, we rebuilt the simulator. It should now contain the plugin which we created. What do we need to do now? We go to the uh, scheduler settings, uh, scheduler configuration. We need to enable the plugin here. So we add in the uh, default scheduler profile, in the multi-point enabled, we add our regex regex scheduling perfect okay uh, let's try now to schedule something and validate that it works we can use the oh, actually there is a better example yeah so we don't leave out the phoenix nodes so we say new pod uh, name, series, annotation, Phoenix. Okay, it went on the node which we expected. If we check out the filter plugins, we can see here's a regex scheduling plugin. For the OS nodes, it said, aha, okay, it doesn't match the annotation, uh, the regex in the annotation, which is Phoenix dot wildcard. And yeah, if we want to update the plugin, so we'd need to go through all this, the complete dance, we'll update the code, then the rebuild, uh, update the scheduler. And that would be about the scheduling framework. So, Jonathan, Thank on you, to Dan. the main thing. But, uh, wait, like, <laughs> I thought that in the title of the talk, uh, there was like, wasm, right? Uh, so when, when, when are we talking about wasm exactly? Uh, just don't worry, we're getting there. If I can find uh, the right desktop again, yeah. Um, that's, why is this not working? Yes, okay. So, Wasm plugins. That's the third method for extending your Kubernetes scheduler. <laughs> You can do it through something that is called the Wasm extension plugin. That's a little bit confusing, but this is a plugin, not written in Wasm, written in Go, which integrates directly with the scheduling framework, exactly what, like what Dayan showed you. Um, and you build it once. But then what's cool is that that plugin, you deploy it once, you build it once, you deploy it once, and then this one can load different Wasm modules, the, the actual plugins that we want to write at runtime based on the schedule's configuration. It does that by implementing all of the scheduling framework endpoints, so all of the ones that we saw in green, um, and it's forwarding requests for the endpoints to the Wasm plugin 
um, that it got that it loaded, but it does that only for the uh, phases that got implemented in the Wasm plugins themselves. The other ones is just no ops, so there's no cost to that. Um, it's loading the Wasm plugins via URL, so you can deploy your Wasm uh, plugin to a web server, an S3 bucket. Um, so that, that, that basically means that you don't need to recompile and ship the entire scheduler anymore. Um, and also because, it, um, because the Wasm extension plugin is running inside a scheduler process, it's avoiding all the latency and cache inconsistency issues that were associated with the extenders. Developers can write plugins in any language that can compile to WASI. Although right now the support is limited to Go due to the plugins development preceding the WASM component model. We'll get there. As a result, parts of the scheduling framework had to be duplicated or forwarded to the guest environment, so to the WASM module that gets loaded, and that enables the WASM module to call back into the scheduler for certain functions. Additionally, and that's actually quite important with WebAssembly, with Wasm, um, you have a sandboxed environment. So that means that the guest plugin only has access to the functions and resources that have been explicitly defined by the host. So that enhances the security and isolation. Now, while there are more SDKs that could be added for broader language support to the Wasm, to the Wasm extension plugin project, I think we could instead adopt the WebAssembly component model. That's a recent addition to the Wasm world that essentially serves as both an ABI and an IDL. That's lowering the barrier um, to language interop interoperability by allowing the automatic generation of bindings with, with BindGen uh, for a variety of popular programming languages. And this would further simplify and expand the use of Wasm-based scheduler plugins. So we would really love to have your help uh, on that. So now let's dive into a bit of Kubernetes magic. We have a demo where we'll conjure up a Wasm plugin from scratch. And I will probably will need to speed that up. Um, so here is a Wasm plugin. It is very, very similar, and it's the exact same logic as what uh, Dayan just showed you before. The key difference is, is that it is not importing the um, uh, scheduling framework, but rather, rather the guest SDK from the Wasm extension plugin, which is replicating some of those functionalities. Apart from that, it's virtually identical. Um, the main for that one is a little bit different. The important bit is that we're using, uh, we're not wrapping an entire scheduler this time. We are just wrapping one plugin, and that's it. Um, the way you compile it is, uh, in our case, we, we have a make file for that, but basically you would use tinygo. There are reasons for that, and I can get into it later in the hallway if you want to. Um, so now I'm going to. Um, I'm going to deploy it. This is just compiling. Uh, it was already compiled. And just creating a static web server, which is going to um, serve the plugins that are over here. So how do I enable this? I go back in here. I will remove this regex scheduling because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, woo. Oh, the snippets are gone. That's annoying. What happened to the snippets? Ah. Um, I'm going to add the plugin to the multipoint enable plugins, but that's not enough. We also need to define where to find the WASM module that we want to load. I'm adding that here. I'm applying this. Let's see if it worked. I'm just going to check in the static web server. The static web server got a GET request, so it is loaded. And now let's try to schedule another pod. It's going to be very anticlimactic because uh, it's going to be exactly what you expect it to be. Unless the demo didn't work. Yes, Alphaba went to an OS node. And you can see here. Same principle, we can see the results. So this is all very cool. Uh, I, had, I had also prepared a V2. I will not show it to you, 
The V2 is using pre-filter so that basically the, um, the regex does not need to be compiled for every call to the node, but instead we compile it once during pre-filter. We save it into the state, we retrieve it into each filter call, and we just use that and various other optimizations. It's all in the repo. Well, when you sell it that hard, I think it's not fair not to show it, so. <laughs> uh, we'll need to cut down some other things then, but uh, okay. I, I will quickly, quickly show it. So, um, the differences are here. You've got a whole pre-filter that has been defined now. And as I just explained, this one now is the one responsible for getting the annotation. If there's no annotation, we're done. If there's an annotation, we compile it and we store it in the state. Then in the filter, we don't look at the pod, we only look at the state. If there's no key in the state, then we can just return success and otherwise we can do all match. But what's really, really, really cool with all of this is that now I don't need to do any redeployment. All I have to do is go in here, update my URL, just apply, and now I can create yet another pods. Still women. Let's see where Minerva goes. She goes to Phoenix as expected, except this time that was a more optimized. Of course, in this case, there's only two nodes. Over to you, Dan. Thank you. So, all this was nice, but we want to assure that uh, what we did is performant. So how do we quickly and easily test this at scale? Quok is a powerful toolkit designed for simulating Kubernetes clusters on a massive scale. So Quok stands Kubernetes without kubelet, meaning you have the Quok operator, which actually uh, takes control and uh, uh, fakes nodes meaning you can create how many nodes you want. Literally, you can create thousands. And uh, the footprint is really small. So on your local machine, you can create a Kubernetes cluster with, let's say, 5,000 nodes and uh, schedule what, 100,000 pods on them. Uh, so you, those nodes aren't running uh, a kubelet. Those nodes are managed by the Quok operator. So the Quok operator is in charge of sending the heartbeats and then doing the whole protocol, how a node reports to be healthy with the control plane. So this has a couple of uh, use cases. Or the most obvious one, if you're a scheduler uh, plugin developer, you can use it to see how your scheduler plugin performs if you, let's say, create 5,000 nodes, uh, want to schedule 200 pods per second. If you're doing CRD controller testing, you don't need to use fake clients, or uh, if you want to test your um, validating and mutating webhooks, you can also uh, trigger them at scale. Control plane performance, we actually use this to test etcd and uh, the API server because we do a lot of bad scheduling and we were running into interesting issues. So yeah, what, what you would do with this is create your plugin however you want, uh, WebAssembly, Extender, uh, scheduling framework, uh, add it into your cluster, and then you can just uh, install the Quok operator. You can add a couple of hundred or couple of thousand nodes. You can also install QPrometheus stack because that comes preloaded with uh, really nice Grafana dashboards for Kubernetes API server, for Kubernetes scheduler. And uh, also there is an interesting utility called Batch Simulator, which can be used, uh, you can, schedule pods, jobs, whatever, with predefined frequencies, so you can literally replicate a batch scheduling scenario. So that would be a flow how you could test plugins at scale. I think we're out of time, yeah. so yeah, here's the uh, dashboard which comes from the Cube Prometheus stack. Literally here you could uh, observe if you how how does it perform with the 99th percentile? Does your uh, scheduler plugin improve something, make it worse? Sadly, we'll need to skip the demo, yeah. but... So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We don't have time for questions, I believe.